Thanks for joining us. We love getting to share the message of God's grace with the entire world. If his message has impacted your life, would you share your testimony with us by emailing it to stories at graceorlando.com. We love to hear what God is up to. You can also give in support of this ministry by going to our website and clicking on the give button at graceorlando.com. Thanks again. Well, how are you guys doing? Is everyone doing all right? We're on week uh, 36 of the apocalypse or whatever we're up to now. Uh, <laughs> I'm just glad to see you guys. Thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in at home. Uh, we, are, we are in a series. We're called, it's called Let Me Introduce You, where I feel some kind of privilege to introduce you to God, okay? This amazing opportunity. If you had never met God before, if you had never heard anything about him before, I don't know what you might think. You know, I've lived here in America my whole life. I grew up in a great home that would taught me about Jesus from the, from the get-go, but maybe that's not your story. Maybe you never met him, you didn't know him. And even just to hear as we've talked about that God is agape love, maybe that by itself was huge. It is for me, by the way. I think that's important for all of us to remember so many times. We use that word love so often we forget uh, what it really means when we say that God is love. He's not like you and me. He doesn't love with insecurity. No, he's fully secure. He knows the end from the beginning, and he chose to love you before you ever did anything at all. Like, his way of loving is so far beyond the ways that we think. You know, we talked about last week how he's a cheerful giver. Did you know that about God, that he loves to give you gifts? He loves to give and give and give and give, and just when you thought he's given all that he's going to give, he'll just keep on giving. And then there's the thought that this is going to go on for eternity. I mean, just let that sink in and you feel an incredible gratitude for being created, okay? I don't know what your experience on this planet will be, but just remember that God is a good, good giver and he's gonna give and give and give and he's gonna bless you. Uh, and and the number four this week is also fun. God is good. What is your thoughts on that? What do you, when you hear the word good, what do you think about? All right, if I say the phrase, uh, God is good, Hey, some of y'all remember that, right? God is good all the time, you know? I remember hearing that phrase right as soon as somebody had like totally busted uh, and fallen on their butt, you know? And it was like, God is good all the time. And I'm like, I don't understand this. This person's in pain. Uh, we, were in, uh, we were on a mission trip. But anyway, the idea was this, 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 uh, this mission leader, right, he just, he got it. He just saw in everything, even in moments where it was like, okay, we don't know how to fix this problem. God is good all the time. You know, God is good. So I want to talk about what this word good means to you and me for just a few moments. Because I know that it means something probably totally different than what you may, or, well, I, I want you to hear something totally different. So let's take a look at this. Uh, First, I want to tell a story. Okay, so Clark, uh, Pastor Clark has a book called Pure Grace. You may have heard of it. Uh, and if you haven't, you need to go get a copy, okay? And in the book, he tells a story about Dennis the Menace, okay? He, he re recaptures a story that was really important to him. And I really do think it probably is one of the best examples of, of what it means when we say God is good, to get a, a picture of just how good God is and how gracious he is through that. So he, the story goes like this. You have, you guys remember Dennis the Menace, right? Let's make sure we know. And as some of you here in the front may not have ever heard Basically, picture two kids that just were kids, okay? Uh, Joey, and you got Dennis in this story, uh, and you've got the next door neighbor who just doesn't necessarily like when the kids come over, uh, but the wife does, Mrs. Wilson. She's awesome. So Mr. Wilson's a little bit of a grump, okay? Uh, it'll probably be me when I get older, so get off my lawn now. Uh, but that's how he kind of acted, all right? And so I love this scene that, that, that Dennis and, and Joey, they receive cookies from Mrs. Wilson, and they're coming home, and Joey sort of says to Dennis, I, I don't understand, what good thing did we do to get cookies? And Dennis goes, no, Joey, we didn't get cookies because of some good thing we did, right? We got cookies because of how good Miss Wilson is, right? I'm saying that not in the exact way, but here's how it says. We get cookies because Miss Wilson is good. So in other words, because she was good, the kids enjoyed the blessing of that. And that is our relationship with God in a nutshell. Because he is good, we get to enjoy all of that. Because he is love, we get to enjoy all of that. Because he is, we get. Like, that is how it works. And so in this, in this moment uh, where Jesus is sitting with this woman at a well, as we talked about last week, right, there's not just the love of God present. There's not just, I mean, all of the things that Jesus brought in that moment, but there was the goodness of God that was present with her, sharing with her. 
We have to repent of this idea of what we think good is, okay? Repentance, not in the Latin form, right? Not in what we know in the English language as repentance that involves a lot of sorrow, and I'm so sorry, I'm going to turn from my thing and, and do a 180, and that's what we think repentance means. Repentance really means, if you read it in the way that it was written in Scripture, it means that after being with God, you've changed your mind. He's convinced you that, okay, you know what? What I thought was real wasn't. What I thought was true wasn't. What I thought was good isn't. <laughs> Did you know that? That what you and I think is good isn't. It isn't good. Okay, let me, let me demonstrate. How many of you here are a Cleveland Browns fan? Everybody else. Wow. Everybody else. Are they any good? <laughs> That's not right. They've had a really rough year. I don't know what happened. They should have been good, but they were not good, as usual. Uh, how many of y'all are Eagles fans? You're so brave. We cannot make fun of a... Okay, they're good. Everyone be cool. They're good. Okay. <laughs> I love it. But what we think is often isn't, okay? Uh, how about this? If I say, what's the will of God? Okay, well, many of us immediately start thinking about our own lives. Well, what's the will of God? Well, I'm trying to figure it out. You know, I just don't want to do it wrong. You know, I'm trying to do the will of God for my life. Can I tell you that what we think the will of God isn't? Like, this is the problem. We have to repent. We've got to change our minds about what these things mean in light of Scripture. And so let's, let's take a look at what good looks like. Luke 18, 18 through 19. This rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and he says, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now wait a minute, if Jesus is not good, then we have no chance, right? But I love this moment, what he's saying to this man. This man approaches him and he says this, Good teacher, teacher of things that are good. I, in other words, what he's saying is, is that I want to be good. He goes on to explain that he's, he's kept all of the law, he's, he obeyed his mother and father, he mowed the lawn, he did it all. You know, he was so good, and he goes, good teacher. And Jesus hears, even in the onset of the question, that the, the man is searching for something that he doesn't understand. He wants to be good, right? And how many of us in this room would say, yes, of course, that's me, I want to be good. You don't want to be the bad guys, right? We learned that when we're kids. We want to be good. And so in the same exact way, he's coming to Jesus and he's saying, I want... How do, how, do I, how do I get this goodness? All right, let's talk about this word good. And, and, and even the Greek language, it is a, a colorless term almost, okay? It's just like in our language, you can say good about so many different things. We call good things that are bad things and bad things good things. It, it gets real colorless. It kind of loses its, its meaning, all right? But, but here's what it means in this specific uh, case here when we talk about good. It comes from this word agathos, which means what originates from God, true kindness given generously, the nature of God. So think about that. Now what this man, I believe, was actually asking of Jesus, was he, he may have been asking, hey, teach me about what comes from God, but I believe just knowing humanity, knowing who we are, I believe he was thinking the other Greek word for this, which is kalos. And kalos just simply means the intrinsic character of a person that's good, right? So good teacher, Whereas Jesus really was from God, right, as a manifestation of his will to the world. So, like, we have no concept of what good is here. And here this man is asking, what is good? Let me ask you this, for example, as, as an example of this. When we talk about the good works that you and I have to go do, did you know that God has good works for you and I to walk in? Well, many of us will take that, and we take that idea of something being good, and we latch on to that instead of understanding what we, just, what we just heard. All of our works, every good thing you will ever do will never come from you feeling bad about doing something, okay? Can I just say that? It doesn't start with you feeling guilty and, oh, I should go do this or I should go do this. No, it comes from that generosity, that cheerful giving we talked about last week, that love of God. Where the goodness that comes out is, to put it back in the, the Agathos framework, our works are good when they originate from God, are given generously, and are rooted in agape. Right? It's not about you. You get nothing out of it. Right? It's just these good works that, in other words, it's what God prepared for you because faith, this is how it works. The more you listen to God, the more you believe, the more fruit you will find in your life because you'll just see it everywhere. I believe it's really always there, but you just see it so much easily when you're in tune. So God creates, God creates things that are good. 
All right, let's go backwards. Let's go all the way back to the beginning and see where we got off on this, okay? Because somewhere, somewhere the idea of good was lost. Now, when we first see the creation story, what do we see? God creates everything, right? He creates this beautiful area, this beautiful world, this universe. I mean, there's so many things we could sit here and talk about, the infinite big, the infinite small. He makes all of these things, and he says they are good. That's right. Even roaches are good. I know. Not in my book. <laughs> They look good in only one position, smushed. Um, and that doesn't look good. Anyway, uh, see how confusing good is. Uh, no, but here in this beginning, he creates this garden, and he says it's good. And then he creates mankind, and he says it is good. Now, what are you and I hearing when I say the word good? Well, we probably are hearing things like, oh, it's not bad. You know, it's right or wrong. It's good. No, no, no. It, it, it's from him. It was born of his nature. Everything we saw, all the goodness that we saw came from God's nature, like who he is. He, pre he presented everything to Adam because he knew how awesome that would be for Adam. Everything is for somebody else. Like, that's how he gives. But then there's this tree, and this tree of knowledge is present. Now, I love the way Paul Ellis says this. He says it this way. He says that it wasn't a temptation, right? It wasn't something that was placed there to tempt us, the big red button in the room. No, it was an opportunity to trust God. It was an opportunity to say, no, we believe and we know God, and we just don't even need to eat that tree at all. But the serpent came along, didn't he? And what did he said is that you don't know what good really is, is what he said. Now, he's going to say it in a way that I'll read in just a moment, and every single word he says is a lie, of course. But essentially what he was saying was, is, Eve, you don't really know what good is. It's not just God. There's more to it. And so let's take a look at this lie from Genesis 3, 5. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. But knowing good... I mean, how many different things are in here that are lies? Let's just take a look. God knows that in the day that you eat, that your eyes will be opened? Is that what God said? No. He says it's going to kill you. <laughs> you will die the moment you do this. That's what love looked like, right? Love was protective. Love was looking out for us. He knew the removal of our innocence was death, right? We would no longer trust God anymore. We would trust our ways and ourself. And in fact, what's... What's incredible about this moment is the moment that they ate of a tree of good, they both lost the ability to know what good is and where it comes from. I mean, so much happened the moment that we decided to, to unplug from the internet, if you will, and plug into ourselves. You know, I, I picture in some ways, you know, if you think of the internet like plugging into the source, right? We, we unplugged and felt like, oh, no, we got a better idea of how everything works. You know, God knows that in the day that you eat, you will die. He says this, your eyes will be opened. Jesus called that kind of goodness blindness. He says, you guys are blind. You can't see at all. This isn't goodness. How about you'll be like God? You'll be like God. You know, we were already made in his image. The Bible says he made us in his likeness. So the devil was trying to fool us into believing that we weren't even as good as God made us. How about this? We will know good and evil. Now, we really know this is what is unholy, what is holy, what is, what is life and death, right? But we would, we would come to know it as a people as right and wrong, and we would live, and how many of us filter all of our lives still through the filter of right and wrong, fairness, you know, an eye for an eye, everything's got to be equal, because that's what's good, that's what's fair. Fairness is good, and we all know that's not true, right? It's graciousness that is good. It is God's grace that is good. God's grace is far better than fairness, and God's goodness is far better than what we know. So Jesus takes this long way around, okay? He goes and he cuts through this part of the countryside that nobody else would go through. Be honestly, because it's hostile. I mean, th this is a hostile time, and you have, if you haven't noticed, it's always a hostile time in this area, okay? And Jesus cuts across where nobody else would go to sit at a well with a woman that nobody else was going to talk to that Jesus knew was going to be there because he wanted her to see just how good he is. Now, just for a moment, I want you to imagine this. God is spirit as well, okay? We know that he's not like us. He's not limited by the physical form. He's not limited to anything, right? He's God. He's divine. He's spirit. And so what I love is that in this moment, this woman doesn't even realize the goodness of God, which, by the way, you can, you can sub out the word goodness and spirit, and you can have the same idea all throughout Scripture. This woman is surrounded by the spirit of God, and she doesn't even realize that it's God's goodness that surrounds her. 
And he says to her, if you just would have asked me, like I came to you, right? This is a crazy thing. And you're asking, why are you talking to me? And why are you, why are you even interacting with me? And do you have any idea? Like, and he's going, if you just would have known the grace of God that's before you and you would have asked, out of his goodness, I would have given you living water. You never would have thirst ever again, ever again. Now, this was to somebody who didn't deserve anything, anything, by, by even the times they were living in. And that's the goodness of God, even in those moments. Let's read it together, John 4, 22 through 24. You worship what you do not know, but an hour is coming and now is when true worship of the Father will happen in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. You know, when I was growing up, uh, there was a time in the church where this was really confusing, okay? Because uh, you had to speak a certain language to, to be a part of this. You had to have a spirit tongue, if you would. Nothing against spiritual languages at all. But that's not what this is talking about. Jesus is saying, he goes, listen, God is spirit, this is a revolutionary idea at this time. To you and me, we know that, but to them, they didn't. To them, that was a huge statement. God is spirit? Wait a minute. He's not an idol that we craft with our hands and we put up there and we say certain prayers and we get blessed and there's this thing? That's what they believed. And so here he is saying that God is not the way that you think he is. God is spirit. In other words, there is nowhere where he isn't. She's sitting here arguing about like where we have the temple and not, not your temple stinks and we got Jacob's well and they're arguing about all these things. And Jesus says, you don't even understand. There is coming a time where nobody's going to go worship God in a temple anymore. There's coming a time where no one's going to go and wonder where God is and try to find him and get him to bless them. All of that is going away and now it's going to be as it really is, right? Aletheia, truth. It's going to be how things really, really are. No more types and shadows. Exactly, this is it. You get to worship God being in union with him. Like, it was a phenomenal statement that he was making in this moment. God is spirit. He's not some statue far away. This word, aletheia, you guys hear it around here quite a bit. It means truth. But in this moment, the tense is this, aletheinos, and it means this, emphasizing the organic connection between what is true. I mean, just get this. What Jesus is saying is, is that I'm reality, right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am what is real. And what he's saying is, is that his spirit is this connection but for you and for me between what is true. We experience reality together because God is spirit. It's phenomenal and totally different than the way that we do things in our world. You remember Moses? Moses said it this way. He said, God, we are walking with you. We're seeing you. We're hearing you. We got fire, and there's all these miracles and all this stuff. And he goes, I just want to see you. And he, and, he, and he shouts this phrase, show me your glory, right? And how many worship songs are filled with this phrase that honestly shouldn't be in there. I'll show you why in a moment. But here's Moses saying, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And what did God do? He says, Moses, you can't handle that. <laughs> you cannot even handle a glimpse of how good I am. So what I'll do is I'll cause my goodness, he says, not his glory, not his spirit. He says, I'll cause my goodness to go before you. you you'll, you'll see my goodness. And you guys remember the story. So I love this idea that God's spirit, that God's glory, that all of these things are tied together in the idea that God is good. So you'll never find a difference there between these, these, these concepts. So here's Moses saying, show me your glory. Let's just, let's just point this out for a moment. Why do you and I not have to sing, show me your glory anymore? Because he showed us his glory, right? Jesus is the glory of the Father. So, you know, we, there was once a time that Moses couldn't see God, and yet you and I did. We get to walk with him in a way. So many times we're jealous of them, aren't we? Man, just to be Elijah, can you imagine? And we're going to get to heaven, guys, and as you know, they're going to look at us and go, you guys got to have the Spirit of God live within you and walk around. That is amazing. <laughs> wow. I just had a sea get parted. I mean, that's cool, but you guys had the spirit inside of you. And that's where we live because God is good. God distinguishes good from what we think is good. Let's read this scripture together. Let's, let's see just how good he is. Hebrews 5, 5 through 10. So Christ did not glorify himself. Here's this glory. So as to become a high priest. But he said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. 
Just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Now listen, this is this, this, is this moment you remember where Jesus is, is down on his knees, he's in the garden, and he's crying out to God saying, is there any way else we can do this? Like, I, I don't want to do this. He, he's, he's like us. He knew the death that was coming. And so I love this. He says that, no, just like us, loud crying and tears to the one. But although he was his son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. So Jesus shows us what true obedience to God really looks like, right? And by the way, he does what you and I will never, ever be able to do, okay? You and I could never have done this, so he does it. And so he does this thing perfectly. And having been made perfect, he became to all, that's you and me, those who obey him. Now underline those who obey him, we'll come back to that. The source of eternal salvation being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. His obedience. Now, now catch this, okay? Because this is where I think a lot of believers get hung up. God, you are so good. I just want to do things for you, right? And we're going to talk about that in a moment. God, you're so good. My response is I want to I, I, I get involved. And I love that Jesus goes ahead and he does the hardest thing that you and I will ever be faced uh, with on this planet, and that is obeying God. Do you know how hard that is? Oh, you can say it's easy, and it's not, right, unless you understand what it truly means. But in this way, right, obeying God the way Jesus did was utterly impossible. And yet, many believers today still think it's up to them to do it, right? Oh, yeah, Jesus did it, so I'm going to do it. You know, I'm just like him. He took his cross. I'm getting my cross. Now listen, everything Jesus did was so that you didn't have to do it, because you couldn't do it, although you are still asked to do what? Obey. So let's look at what obeying really means. 1 John 3.23, this is his commandment. Here it is, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. If you get that order backwards, it'll mess you all up. The idea is that you would believe. What is the commandment? What is the thing that God has given you to do? How, how do you obey? You believe. And you know that he even helps you with that. So you believe God, and because you believe God, you will love others. So no, God has not placed upon you ever showing him how much you, you know, appreciate all the things he's done or what. No, he wants you to believe. Believe. It's really that simple. Now, there's more to it, of course, but it begins with this idea of believing and continues on with loving others. God is a person. He has a will, and he is good. And God works all things together for good. Uh, we're going to talk just for a moment, uh, in a moment, um, about Job. And I want you to remember that, that God works all things together for good. Look at what Paul says in Romans 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Who's the will of God? Jesus. Jesus is the will of God. Scripture says that. And I love this. Is Jesus good and perfect in all of those ways? Yes. And so I love this idea. The idea is, is to not be conformed to the patterns of this world. We so often believe that just means like bad stuff. Like don't go out there and drink and go to the clubs and sleep around. And that's not what this is talking about. This means even trying to see the world through the lens of good and bad. Like that's good, that's bad, that's good, that's bad. You know that's bad for you? <laughs> it's bad for you. Not that there aren't times when that's important. But it's better for us to see the world the way God sees the world, to look at things spiritually, to see things after the Spirit, as things really are. How often do you, do you, you feel you, you get into a relationship issue with somebody and then you suddenly discover that they were going through something and that's why, and you, there's more to the story, right? Well, that's the same way here, right? We're not, we're not being conformed to something. We're being metamorphosed or transformed, right? We've been transformed into this beautiful butterfly 
that can't go backwards and do a caterpillar again, and you can't go backwards in any way either. No, the goodness of God prevents that. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 17. Therefore, since that is true, we recognize nobody according to the flesh. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. New things have come. This is a real challenge, isn't it? We're living in a time where this is very, very, very important. To know that as believers we are saints. You're not a sinner, right? You were a sinner. Now we are saints. And as saints, as those who stand holy as we'll ever be, as saints, as those who have the capacity to see everything that's happening around us with spiritual eyes, we have an opportunity to love in a way that this world needs so desperately right now, don't we? It's so easy to get caught up in the politics of the day. It's so easy to get caught up in should we wear masks or shouldn't we wear masks. It's so easy to get caught up in all of these things. At the end of the day, God calls us to something so much higher, and he calls us to love, and he calls us to this place where we can see things as they actually are. You know, nowadays, I don't know about you, whenever I run into a situation where somebody shipwrecks their faith, you know, utterly just blows it. I don't know about you, but there's no sense of disappointment for me. It, to me, it's almost weird if I had an expectation that every single person in this room is going to live their life totally scot-free, perfect, good. No, what I want to see from good, right, is God. I want to see God in you, God in every shipwreck. He's there to restore and fix and, and, and to do things that are so far beyond what we can even imagine. Like, that's, the pl- that's what he's talking about when he says we don't see people after the flesh anymore. It's that you don't see anything the way that it used to be anymore. And that's why we don't have to get sucked into so many things that other people do. We can just love and love well. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And we can't even fathom this. Listen to these. Don't look these up. Just listen to me for just a moment. Isaiah 53.10 says this. The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. How could we call that good? If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. This, this is all about Jesus. And, and, and I'll be honest, if I was reading this with physical eyes, I would say, how can this be good? You're going to crush your own son? You find pleasure in that? Well, he goes on to say something incredible about goodness that we don't understand, because God gets the last word on everything, okay? And he can bring life into death. He can bring life out of death. He can do things that you and I just don't fathom. And so I love this where something we would read into and say, how can that be your good pleasure? Well, all it takes is to go find Jesus in the story and we can see how, how God had it all worked out. Look at this in John eleven four. He says this, this will not end in death. It's for the glory of God so that the son of God may be glorified. He's talking about Lazarus. Lazarus goes, what was, he did die. And everybody goes, if you just would have gotten here being the good teacher that you are, Wouldn't you have just saved Lazarus from all of this? And look at what he says. This does not end in death. Believer, this does not end in death. I don't know what it is you're going through. I don't know if you have this feeling or sense that like, God, I thought you were so good, and yet look at what I'm going through. This does not end in death. He gets the last say, and we can trust that. Look at John 11, 40. Believe me, Jesus says. And you will see the glory of God. You guys know what that means at this point. You will see the goodness of God. You will see it go before you. Trust me. Believe me. It's the only thing he's left for you to do is to believe in just how good he is. Uh, Just to touch on Job for a moment. Job, last week we talked about him. He's he's this person who who we know uh, experienced great loss. Maybe that's been your story. A friend of mine, after last week, after talking about it, happened to post a long post on her Facebook wall about how wonderful the story of Job was and how encouraging it was to her. I was confused. I also stayed out of a Facebook argument. But I I did watch this going, I'm going to pray for you because it broke my heart. And she quotes this as one of her favorite lines. She says, should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? That's what Job said when his wife said, we should curse God. And he goes, what? You think God's just going to give us good stuff? No, he gives us bad things too. 
Job didn't know God. We know that, right? He, he's a shining example of what religion can produce, right? A, a good person, right? Somebody who was super good and followed God and honored him in all of his ways. Well, that's wonderful. But he didn't know God at all because he thought that God gives him bad stuff. God, who is agape love, who is a cheerful giver, will never give you anything that's bad, only good. He'll take bad things out of your life that are just are destroying you and give you something way better anyway. But he's never going to take anything good away from you. And if you take that idea, uh, this is what somebody wrote on that same post. God allows bad things to happen to teach us patience and endurance. You see how we take it. We take an idea from Job that's not even accurate, but it's in the Bible, and we apply it to our lives in a way that's not correct, and all of a sudden you are now believing that God allows the devil into your life to do things to train you up. I mean, really think about how sick that is. Like, as a dad, I'm going to let anybody come teach my kid a lesson? You better, you're kidding yourself. <laughs> they barely learned from me, you know? <laughs> no, God doesn't use the devil as a sheepdog. That's, that's not how this works. No, God is a giver of good things. Listen to this. What shall we call good then? Uh, here we go, John 6, 28 through 29. Therefore they said to him, what shall we do? What good thing can we do so that we may work the works of God? And Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe. You want to do something? You want to be a part? You ready? Believe. <laughs> That's not enough, all right? <laughs> Romans 2, 7, how about this? To those who by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Now, wait a minute. There's that word perseverance. Let's look at it together in the next verse where it kind of, it all kind of comes together. Those who by perseverance and doing good, okay, the spirit, his glory, Hebrews 10, 36, for, for you have need of an endurance. You and I both do. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Did you catch it? How do you get the very thing that you need? How do you persevere? How do you get your endurance? The will of God. And what was the will of God? To believe. <laughs> to believe. The moment you believe, you are transformed into a saint, a spirit being. Right? You may look the same, but you're not the same. You have a spirit of power, of a sound mind, of self-control. You have an ability that others don't. And you can love people from that place. And I love this, that when we have a need, I love that the will of God would be that you would believe and receive the very thing that you need. He didn't make it complicated. He didn't make it to where it's based on what you've done for him. It's not about your good works securing some kind of blessing from God. He's good, so you get the cookie. <laughs> That's how it works. So our idea of goodness is flawed if we believe that our loving Father puts us through things. No, he doesn't put you through things. He saves you from things. Jesus promised you trouble. He said, oh, you're going to have trouble in this world. He's not going to put you through it. It's already here. <laughs> Coronavirus, hello. But he says, I'll walk with you through it. I'll save you. I'm in you. There, be encouraged with a couple more scriptures this morning before we close. Romans 8, 31 says this, What then shall we say if God is for us, who is against us? Please stop and just think about that. If God, which by the way he is, <laughs> is for us. If God is for us. He's not taking things from us. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against the elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God who intercedes for us? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? Just as it's written, for your sake we're being put to death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And all these things, though, we overwhelmingly conquer, underline that, through him who loved us. 
For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor coronavirus, nor height, nor depth, nor any, it's right there, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing that's going to separate you from the goodness of God that's going to continue to be good to you because he's good and not based on anything you've ever done. Like, that's what you and I get to enjoy every single day. And if you find yourself asking the question, saying, after all of that, after hearing that God doesn't allow things to refine me and all this kind of stuff, he walks with me, the Spirit promises me that I will overwhelmingly conquer. That's overwhelmingly. That's ridiculously conquered, okay? Like, it's embarrassing how bad the enemy lost, conquered, okay? But that's how good our God is. Now listen, here it is. If you look at yourself and you go, okay, yeah, but I got, I still see certain things that don't look good. I still see, and you think through that framework. And it's hard to believe that, Javen, can I really be a saint? How can you say that? Well, listen to Colossians as we kind of wrap this up. For in him, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him... You were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Oh, I wish you could underline that twice. In the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Pastor Matt, last week at uh, Static at SYC, he he shared with the students uh, physical problems Uh, have spiritual solutions. Physical problems have spiritual solutions. I thought that was awesome. And it really, really does speak to the situations all of us are going through right now. And maybe you would look at yourself and say, Javen, I I, want to believe that God hears my prayers. I want to believe that I'm blessed. I want to believe, I want to believe, I want to believe. But I look at myself, I see things that I would even consider not good. Well, you just heard There was this circumcision that took place without hands. It it wasn't the way that we know. And the cutting away of the the body of of flesh, this the sin, the sin that was in us, this this thing that plagued you and I and kept us from being able to see God. God removed this from us. And he calls you as you are, a spirit being. It's counterintuitive to these eyes. It doesn't make any sense. In the same way we looked at a tree of knowledge of good and evil at one point in time, we, we we don't really know what we're looking at. There's going to be times you're going to look at me and say, well, I don't look good. (laughs) And yet, if you look at me through spiritual eyes, you'll see that what is inside of me is God. And that's always good. And so when I look at all of you, that's exactly what I see as well. If you've believed and you've come to life, that life within you is so, so good. (laughs) And it's good in all of the ways that matter. It's good in the sense that you'll never have to worry about, like, did I get all my sins forgiven? Yep, he's that good. It's good in the sense of, yeah, but then, oh, I forgot to pray about, oh my gosh, I have a test. I didn't, he, he thought of that. He, he went ahead of you. Romans 8 says the Spirit will pray on your behalf because he knows you missed it. I mean, you can't fail because of how good God is. So even when things look a certain way, remember, he did a circumcision that cut away all that we know, <laughs> that we know, and he presents to us a knowledge of who he really is that we can live off of. And James says it this way, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights who doesn't change. <laughs> In other words, there's no shifting shadow. He's not changing. If he was good then, he's good now, he's going to be good forever. If he gave then, he gave now, he's going to give forever. If he was loved then, he's loved now, he'll love forever. This is who he is. I want to end with with this thought. And remember, keeping in mind that we get the cookie because God is good. Listen to this. You don't have to wonder how good God is. He gave you Jesus. You don't have to wonder what the will of God is. He gave you Jesus. You don't have to ask him to show you any glory because he gave us Jesus. You don't have to wonder if you are abiding in him because he gave us the Spirit. 
You don't have to wonder if God, if you'll lose your salvation because he gave you the spirit. You don't have to wonder if God will reject you because Jesus showed us the Father. You don't have to wonder if God is withholding blessings from you because Jesus showed us the Father. (laughs) God is all around you. He's in your mouth and in your heart. He is the Spirit who is all around you at all times, making all things work together for good. And that both means your good and to reveal how good he is. That's your father, and that is what he did for us. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we love you so much. You're so, so good all the time. Lord, even when we fall on our butts, as I said earlier, we can still sit there and go, God, you're so, so good. Because as long as you are around, even dead things can come back to life. As long as you're around, whatever issues we have, you've already gone before. So, Lord, we trust in that goodness, that goodness that went before Moses that we saw come out of a tomb. You're so good. I pray that nobody in this room would ever think that you're against them, that you've forgotten about them, or that you're anything but for them. And if there's anyone here this morning, Lord, that feels that way, or maybe they're sitting at home, God, I pray that you would affirm them right now in the spirit. In Jesus' name. Would you guys stand with me one more time this morning?